My name is uh, Dev Sinha, or um, I actually prefer Dave if I'm introducing myself to folks from uh, the Indian subcontinent. Um, and this is a, a sort of introductory video for the uh, lecture series that I volunteered to give. Um, it's called Algebraic Topology from a Geometric Viewpoint. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about logistics, uh, say a little bit more about the mathematics, more than I was able to say in the email, and then just um, step back and talk about uh, perspective and um, just introduce myself uh, a little bit more. So logistics, um, the live versions of this will be on Mondays, uh, noon Eastern time, an exception being this coming Monday, the 30th. Um, I'll have a little catch up session at 11, as well as the, the noon session. Um, and this will be uh, primarily in two modes, Zoom, and that's sort of this software that lets you uh, have meetings, uh, lots of classes are being run on it now. Um, and uh, also I'll be on YouTube Live. And I, in fact, what I'm doing now is I'm streaming both uh, through Zoom and YouTube Live with a, an audience of one or, or zero, depending on how you define audience, um, or more for, for people who eventually watch this. Um, in any case, the YouTube Live will let uh, more people, if, if you have trouble running Zoom or that kind of thing, um, watch. And it will also uh, record. So that's why I decided to, to use YouTube Live as well. I'll be using a web whiteboard um, application called awwapp.com. AWW is web whiteboard. I've been using that for years to collaborate with uh, people remotely, um, including this year I'm visiting um, MIT, but I'm affiliated with the University of Oregon. I've got four PhD students. So I spend a lot of time on um, this whiteboard app, um, and that's part of why I was very comfortable in trying to um, bring more people into a lecture series that I've been giving at MIT. Um, a third element, uh, because I have had a remarkable amount of, um, of interest, uh, it seems uh, about 160 or so people uh, try to hold some office hours as well, uh, most likely through Google Hangouts, but we could switch to Zoom if, if those get popular. Google Hangouts has a, a limit of 10. So um, this will all be an email to the people who contacted me. Um, by the way, if you Google my name, maybe with the word math, you should be able to find my email on my page at the University of Oregon, and um, I can put you on the list for this as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to um, share my screen. This screen will be um, uh, showing my uh, the web whiteboard. Now, actually, I'm using the app whiteboard on my tablet, um, but this uh, browser will be um, showing what's what's then written there. And anybody who wants can um, can tune in to this um, AWW app page as well. And even right there, although I ask you not to, um, unless we arrange for that. Um, and so uh, that's another way that uh, I'll try to both publish these whiteboards and um, let people uh, just look at them while I make them. That might be an easier way to um, see what's going on, although the whiteboard doesn't have my voice. Um, so. What's the preview of the mathematics that we're going to be doing? Well, I um, and in the background there are these uh, what I like to call tome classes, and that's just a way to um, to understand cochains geometrically. Um, this will be part of the preview catch up kind of uh, lecture, and the basic setup is if I've got some submanifold of a manifold then um, it's at the co-chain level, it's given by essentially intersection. So if I've got some map from a simplex into um, the manifold, um, the value of this co-chain is just gonna be looking at the pre-image and counting it with signs. So you'll need to sort of have a co-oriented manifold. And I won't go into the details here because this is just a preview. A good example to think about is if m is um, r2 minus 0, r2 minus the origin, then um, 
then what you can do is think about, um, so here's M. Um, then our W could be um, the positive X axis. And uh, then what is tau W doing? Tau W is gonna be measuring for something that goes around. Um, tau W of, of this uh, sigma is gonna be one in this case. So it's just uh, an intersection, but happening at the, the co-chain level. There's of course some technical issues. If you've had some differential topology, you know that these counts don't exist in general, especially um, you do need some differentiability, but um, these are some objects in the back of my mind as I uh, develop um, uh, a number of other topics. So uh, using these tone classes, um, we're going to talk about in the first, again, preview lecture, um, I want to talk about uh, configurations of endpoints in RD. And again, as an example, we would have of that, you just have an R2, um, just some collection of points, x1, x2 x3, they're labeled. And so um, we can talk about that, uh, that topological space. It's just the complement of the linear subspace of a product of that Euclidean space with itself. So that'll be the main topic of the, um, the, the catch-up lecture. And then um, the first lecture itself, I'm going to talk about um, something that my collaborator, Ben Walter, and I called Hopf invariance. So, um, and that's because what Hopf uh, first noticed in the, um, in the 30s was that if you had a map from the three sphere to the two sphere, what you could do is you could take two points in the two sphere. You could look at their pre-images in the three sphere. And you could um, count their linking numbers. Um, and that's the Hopf invariant. And the way we'll generally think about linking numbers is co-bounding one of the, um, the two and then looking at the intersections of the other one which would be this point in this case. Um, yeah, you can hopefully see that, that I drew that in. I'll make that purple even so it comes out better. So um, that's what Hopf said. So we count these intersection points and you can call it, if this is, um, if I've got a P and a Q here, I'm gonna look at the pre-image of P um, and I'm going to intersect it with, um, I'm first going to co-bound it, and then I'm going to intersect it with the pre-image of Q. So um, what we noticed is that this game actually continues, and this is something that essentially Sullivan noticed, but now we've got, uh, we had a different take on things with um, uh, our, our, uh, both our formalism and some of our geometry. So let's suppose now we have a map from S4 to a wedge of three two spheres. And I've got a point in each. It's going to be away from the base point. And I'm going to let um, the pre-images, um, let me just call them um, by the, the capital, capitalized uh, version of those letters. And of course, we can just then picture this. Now, what happens in differential topology is that if something is um, transverse, and generally we will um, assume transversality in everything we do, basically, um, now we have three uh, pre-images. And those pre-images have the, the share the fact that the uh, their co-dimension is the same as the co-dimension of the, the object, in this case, just points that we're taking um, pre-images up. 
So co-dimension two inside of S4 means I've got three surfaces. And what you can then do is um, look, for example, at, um, we can take, and now let me uh, move things here. This is the one thing that might get a little clunky in what I'm doing. I'm trying to both, um, I'm working on essentially two screens, one that I'm drawing on, kind of one that I'm having to uh, make sure you can see what I'm drawing. Um, in any case, if I look at, we take um, the, the, the P, the pre-image of P and co-bound it and look at, do the same with the pre-image of Q. And these are now each co-dimension one. So if I intersect them, that's co-dimension two and so is R. And that ends up being a Hopf invariant invariant of G. It's something that helps um, distinguish between uh, different maps up to homotopy. So, um, so those are our um, main objects that we'll be talking about. And um, the thing I like about this subject and the reason I, I think this is a nice place to go first is that it, it marries um, well these different aspects of topology. So there's got some good geometry and that's the geometry of linking. There's some nice algebra to discuss. It's called the Harrison complex. Harrison was um, a professor at the University of Oregon back in the um, the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, there's, uh, and that's a kind of uh, bar complex. Um, there's combinatorics. And remarkably, that is uh, deeply related to the combinatorics of um, configuration spaces. So there's some fun games with graphs and trees. And then um, there's a category theory, or um, I just like to say categorics because category theory sounds somewhat inaccessible and pretentious, but this is just sort of thinking about what are the objects? How are we manipulating these objects through, through different uh, ways? And the categorics in this case is that of Quillen functors. So, um, so that's what we'll talk about next time. And then probably the time after that, um, what I'll do is get to talk about some new work. Hopefully that'll be hot off the presses. Um, we'll see, I'm writing the, the final arguments, I hope, um, work with uh, my student, um, Jeff Monroe. Um, so the, the Hopf invariants as described above are, are for simply connected spaces, but this idea seems to apply to non-simply connected spaces. Um, so pi one of a wedge of spheres um, is an analog of like pi two of a wedge, of, pi four of a wedge of, of, of two spheres. Um, and what you can do is play very similar games instead of um, P's, Q's and R's, well, of course, Pi one, I don't have to draw a picture. Well, I could. I could sort of look at at a at, at pre-images of points, um, and that ends up being, um, of course, equivalent to recording your element of pi one in a word. And what I like to do is use capital letters for inverses. And so this is um, a threefold commutator I'm writing down. This is A, B, C. And if, I'm, if I think about, um, instead of D inverse P, et cetera, let's look at something that I might call D inverse A intersect D inverse um, 
C intersect um, B. So um, now I'm going to take A A inverse pairs. And I'm also going to take um, C C inverse pairs. And then I'm going to count the number of times that B occurs between them. And we see that that happens once. So if I count this number, I get one. And these are entirely analogous to the Hopf invariants in higher dimensions. And um, hopefully will. I expect they will serve as a, a, a part of an, a, an integrated approach to rational homotopy theory using uh, cochains. So that's fancy letters, but the fun thing is that this is entirely sort of uh, combinatorial and something that um, anyone who's ever played with some basic group theory could, could start um, engaging with. Um, from there, we're going to switch topics. So that'll be Hopf invariance. Um, again, maybe two, maybe even three uh, lectures, depending how that goes and what people uh, want to hear about. Um, I want to then go back to something that most uh, topologists have studied as, uh, as part of their graduate training, which are characteristic classes. Um, but really, um, let's remember that these are homology and, well, they're supposed to be cohomology, but I want to think about homology and cohomology of infinite Grassmannians. And so what I will um, do is uh, really kind of go back to, um, let's revisit the foundations a bit. Through some of these tome classes. And then I also wanted to um, talk about both the homology and the cohomology and the pairing between them. Um, and for example, something that is, is, should be much better known that the homology is always represented by products of, um, by products of um, projective spaces. So you take the fundamental class of a product of a projective space. And that's something that I think um, isn't emphasized in the standard treatments that um, is, is, uh, is fun to notice and, and then explore the pairing. Um, from there, we'll talk a little bit about, um, I'll introduce the way I like to think about um, Eilenberg McLean spaces. Um, and here I, I sort of, there's, there's what I think of as sort of uh, natural geometric models. Um, and then also the geometry of the simplicial model. So for example, um, the natural geometric model for, uh, for KZ1 is the circle. So that's great. But there are times where you want to think about um, the, the simplicial model, which is just a bunch of points on the interval with, um, with integers uh, labeling them with some identifications. Um, the latter one really leads to, to fun um, making these Eilenberg McLean spaces a little bit more um, accessible if you, if you like pictures. Namely, um, well, let me just give you a picture of KZ3 that'll sit on your desktop. Um, it's just a cube. And, um, and you then think about uh, a cube with different points inside labeled by, um, by integers. Um, and well, 
it'll sit on your desktop if you want to think about it that way. If you you unravel the definitions, it's still an infinite dimensional object. But but now we've got a model that um, that we can reason about. Um, closely related, and in fact surprisingly um, closely related at the prime two, um, are uh, unordered configuration spaces. And in particular, I'm going to look at in infinite dimensions. And I'm going to um, take the quotient um, by the symmetric group action. So these are unlabeled configuration spaces, unordered. And the, the wonderful fact here is that these are a model for, um, for classifying spaces of symmetric groups. And so I'm going to talk about their um, homology. And we'll be drawing some pictures like this. And their cohomology. And I'll be drawing some pictures like this. And um, but the wonderful thing is that this geometry um, is reflected um, closely. It's what led me to rediscover um, with my collaborators, uh, Chad Giusti and Paolo Salvatore, a uh, Hopfring structure that's originally due to, to Neil Strickland and Paul Turner. Um, and there's a lovely, um, at least I think, a uh, very concise statement of what these cohomology groups of symmetric groups are, uh, mod p, um, especially mod two with this Hopfring structure. And this also implies um, that we know a lot about um, the cohomology of um, a space that's called QS naught. Let me make it more elementary if we take the direct limit of um, maps from spheres to the, themselves and look at the, the base point component, the degree zero component, um, then uh, that's uh, a space that um, sort of underlies the, the stable homotopy theory, if you will. And, um, and it remarkably has the same cohomology as BS infinity, something that Barrett and Pretty originally noticed and Crone and Siegel um, uh, did some space level versions of that. So then finally, um, let me just say, we'll revisit um, Eilenberg and Klein spaces after I talk about those. Um, And then, um, and then I'll also talk about the, the, the Blaker's Massey theorem, which will sound like a technical theorem, but it really um, underlies some remarkable mathematics, both in homotopy theory and its um, interfaces with uh, differential topology. We'll start with um, what I can call a bit of causal duality to motivate um, why you'd even be interested in this technical theorem. But then suffice it to say that, um, well, well, we'll go through quite a bit, but eventually get to um, not invariance. Oops. So, um, so that'll be a, a, a story with, with, again, some current, um, work that I might be able to share. Um, and then we'll finally end with these uh, tome classes that I've uh, I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and just looking at their cup products, but then cup I operations. And maybe, uh, well, so eventually, again, this will be some, there's work in progress. Um, we're not so close to this, but I'll at least say a little bit about a project to, uh, to really make parts of the, the homotopy theory of manifolds uh, more um, accessible through the differential topology of those manifolds. So, um, 
I should then say that in general, uh, here I'm gonna be lighter on the details. Um, some of these things will have uh, papers that are published that you can look at details uh, in. Others, um, not yet, you know, I've, uh, there's a lot of things that I wish I had time to, to write up. I've given some of these um, in various classes. Uh, I've taught at the University of Oregon and uh, told people about some of these topics, but haven't had a chance to sort of write the, uh, the book that would be sort of intermediate algebraic topology from a geometric viewpoint or, or, or something like that. So, um, but with this audience, uh, maybe some folks would be uh, interested in, in working out some of those details, especially if, if you found that it was useful for your work. Um, I'm going to, uh, to change my view back to, uh, to just uh, the, the, the default Zoom view of, of me as a talking head. Um, and just finish up with a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of more, a little bit more about myself. Um, so the philosophy, um, what I really love is an interplay of um, geometry, algebra, combinatorics, and categorics. Um, and I and I often think of the geometry and, and the categorics as sort of pointing you in the right direction, and then. Um, you know, the, the algebra and the combinatorics uh, that arise is sort of what let you really describe what's what's going on. So um, it's it'll be heavier on the geometry, but I certainly, um, I like the combination ultimately. And um, the other thing about this is I, is I plan to take my time a bit. Um, there's a lot of graduate students who've indicated interest in this and I feel like um, it's better to, to uh, well, I mean, people who want can skip ahead on, at times uh, and get to the good parts. That's the good thing about uh, if you're looking at these uh, recorded. But uh, more, more profoundly for me uh, is the influence of, of people like Raoul Bott, who uh, I had an opportunity to, to even see as an undergrad at a conference. Um, and at that and I was a conference uh, just about a mile away from where I'm at physically right now. It was at Northeastern University. It was at the 100th year of um, celebrating the 100 years after the birth of uh, Czech. And um, in, in talking about these quantum knot invariants, uh, what we now call bot Taubes integrals, bot, uh, talked about, well, you can, you can sort of have some uh, something that sort of points you there, and then you you go and plow through as much as 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 you can to to prove the 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 existence or or whatever. But um, what Bot was looking for was some perspective that that led you there, and he 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 compared mathematics to a river. Um, an old river that sort of winds around and he talked about the value of just letting that river uh, take you where um, where it wants to in a sense where where it just is um, so um, I will be trying to um, have that kind of uh, approach to things and and hopefully some of these uh, the the perspective comes out because of that so um, yeah, so as I, I mentioned, I'm now based in, in Boston in this um, remarkable time, thankfully, uh, but I should say right now, um, things are not uh, horrible here, but uh, I think everybody expects them to, to be pretty bad in a couple of weeks uh, as they are in New York now and Italy and, um, and Spain. Um, so I appreciate folks taking the time to, to to join me for some mathematics. I hope you, you enjoy it. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm faculty at the University of Oregon. I'm visiting MIT now. I'm actually, it's uh, invited by Haynes Miller, who is my undergraduate research uh, uh, supervisor when I was an undergrad there. Um, I went from there to Stanford. I was a student at Gunnar Carlson, but I also um, uh, talked a lot with Ralph Cohen there. Um, I was a postdoc at Brown with uh, Tom Goodwillie before ending up at Oregon. 
And I've really been working at the interface um, between more, uh, with algebraic topology, but maybe a more geometric perspective since I was a grad student, and that was in equivariant boredism. Um, and boredism was a very natural place to think in these ways, although interestingly, like, so there I, I read some papers on, you know, EG plus smash this and, um, uh, you know, fixed points versus geometric fixed points and sort of reconstructed the geometric perspective that um, like Connor and Floyd had, had started, but I was reading later papers that, that referred to them. And, and so that experience definitely colored my, uh, my mathematics. Um, uh, and having to uncover what was the geometric origins of a, of a subject. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate to then be able to, to uh, work in a number of areas, equivariant uh, topology, um, uh, knot theory, configuration spaces, group cohomology, rational homotopy theory. Um, I've also been doing a lot of work on uh, mathematics education and actually even at the policy level, I've, for example, did some substantial work on a um, assessment, the smarter balance assessment that has given to, that has currently been given to millions of students every year. Um, there's a piece um, in the notices of the American Mathematical Society that I wrote for a, well, it's, it's an audience of research mathematicians there talking a little bit about how we should aspire to have more reasoning, more proof in K-12 mathematics. Um, a lot of my policy work is actually uh, wanting authentic mathematics of, of both basic types, which to me are, are either uh, pure, where, where you're talking about uh, for authentic mathematics, you want students engaging in proofs, and that includes in, in very early grades throughout, um, but also uh, applied mathematics. And authentic mathematics there means working with real data or reasoning about error or things uh, like that, or not being given the mathematical tool uh, ahead of time, just some problem in the world and, and part of the the mathematical process is then to figure out what is the mathematics uh, relevant. So that's been a, uh, a wonderful experience. And for example, um, the state of Oregon had me work with, um, we'll give, give some presentations to about 1500 teachers and administrators around the state. And, and we're still trying to, to work to change a system that essentially was designed in the 1890s and 1950s. Um, but in uh, our day and age, we, would like it to, to work for our students uh, better and in different ways. So that's some things about me. Um, and uh, I hope that a lot of you uh, continue and, and watch some of these lectures and, uh, and I get to interact with you and, and get to know you a bit. Great, I will uh, stop the recording.